So what about the procedure itself? We will get to that now. Here are some images, some extravasation, your, the appearance of irregular vessels, and obviously here are some irregular vessels leading to some tumors. So pre-procedure access and our initial imaging. We need a neuro exam for baseline, obviously, because our, you know, we're concerned about the AR artery of Adamkowitz and the spinal cord. Usually femoral access is used. There is brachial access can be used, but um, from what I've heard, it's, you know, I've only done it from femoral and it seems like there can be a higher morbidity or complication rates. However, in some cases, um, it, it can be useful. I'll mention that later. As I was mentioning, thoracic aortograms can be really great in identifying, you know, either the bronchial arteries and or the intercostals and a lot of the vessels. So let's say you, you get your you know, image done and you can see uh, the bronchial arteries. The selected catheterization of them, or if you can't see them and you're just, you know, you decide, okay, I know exactly where they should be and you're going to you know, give it a try because uh, we know 70% of the right comes off the intercostal bronchial trunk. We will, um, you know, various catheters can be used, but usually, as you've seen on the images that I've just shown, a reverse curve seems to be preferred, especially for the right. A Contra, Sauce, Simmons, the Shepherd's Crook, Mickelson, anything with that reverse curve um, can be useful. However, people have used Cobras. Some people are very used to using a Cobra to catheterize these vessels. They're quite small, so we do have to remember. Aberrant bronchial arteries arising from the aortic arch just sort of anywhere um, can sometimes be very difficult to catheterize. And that's why that's a time when the, um, you know, the brachial artery approach might be useful um, because you're not taking this sort of known reverse curve path into those bronchial arteries or intercostal bronchial trunk. So once again, left main stem bronchus, convenient landmark for the general location of the bronchial arteries um, where it crosses the uh, descending aorta it's a good place to look for the intercostal bronchial trunk if you're looking for the right bronchial artery you would direct your catheter anterolateral or just lateral to the right for the left bronchial artery as i mentioned the catheter i mean the vessel usually comes off directly anterior and this is the time when you would get your images and you know, make sure that the arteries you see, if you think they're bronchial arteries, they course along the main stem bronchi. And um, the intercostals, as we know, they initially turn cephalad and then laterally along the underside of the rib. Um, once you selectively catheterize the bronchial arteries, you've puffed, you think you're in there, perform hand angiography. Um, uh, can't do power, they're very, very small vessels, about five to 10 milliliters of iodinated contrast. You really might only need about three and you know, gently um, perform a, a digital subtraction angiogram. And you wanna remember, as I said, the spinal artery, you know, it, it courses over the center of the spine. Um, and since that can be very misleading, uh, you wanna make sure that you position either the patient or angle the II properly to be able to see that vessel. Because you know, the spinous processes may obscure your visualization of the vessel, especially since it is quite small um, and has that takes that hairpin turn. So what is a positive bronchial artery angiogram? We rarely see active extrav, only 10%. Really, it's those irregular vessels that you've been seeing on, you know, these images I've been showing for anatomy. Um, a lot of the, those signs can help identify the source of bleeding or can basically be considered a positive finding. The hypertrophied vessels with parenchymal hypervascularity, bronchial artery aneurysms, which I mentioned, um, shunting from the bronchial artery to the pulmonary vein or the pulmonary arterial system. 
So this is really why I think a lot of the bronchial artery angioms can be considered quite difficult because, you know, when we're there in the middle of the night and somebody's bleeding out from a car accident, you can definitely, you know, you can usually see blood pooling and here that really isn't, um, is not exactly what we're looking for. So here's um, an image where we can see some active extrav. Even with that, it's, you know, it's a little bit odd in appearance. Um, and if you just saw the beginning of the artery here, I think even that has a very irregular course. It's tortuous. It just doesn't look right, even without seeing that active extrav at the bottom. If there's shunting, this is what bronchial artery to pulmonary vein shunting would look like. We have our arterial system here, the bronchial artery. And then later on in, this in the phase of this angiogram, we see ourselves with the completely different appearance of the pulmonary veins filling. We have bronchial artery to pulmonary artery shunting. Here on this image, we have this irregular bronchial artery. And then we can see the outline here of the, of the pulmonary artery that nice, smooth, round course, it's going in. We can see that contrast, you know, not exactly, not exactly definitely where it's connecting, but that's a very different appearance um, of the blood that's flowing in the pulmonary artery from this irregular vessel. As you can see, a lot of these images are magged up greatly. Um, so just remember, that this might be necessary, especially to see the artery of Adamkowitz, and keep in mind the uh, radiation exposure, collimating, magnifying, all of these things are very important, which is why that initial angiogram that demonstrates, can sometimes demonstrate all of the intercostals on both sides, can really help you decrease your overall radiation dose. We embolize with microcatheter. Once you're in position in that irregular bronchial artery, you wanna advance your microcatheter into a very stable location. If you're able to see the spinal artery and you're going to continue with embolization, you wanna confirm that the tip of your microcatheter is distal to any branches that supply that artery of Adamkowitz. You're gonna embolize slowly under fluoro the whole time to prevent reflux either into the spinal artery or the aorta. The end point of embolization, is complete occlusion of all of those abnormal vessels leading to the hypervascularity of the parenchyma and until near stasis of contrast within that bronchial artery. So the what's recommended is the use of 500 to 700 micrometers, micrometer particles. Theoretically, particles greater than 300 microns uh, ensure that there's no significant shunting to the pulmonary artery or the pulmonary vasculature. However, um, and well, yeah, in the presence of larger shunts, you know, larger particles or gel foam may be preferred also just to prevent that shunting. Some people have used PVA or gel foam. They're economical, which is great, but PVA can clump. Don't know, uh, we don't often use it here, but if anyone's used it, you see it clumps so, easily, um, really quickly, and you can get a more proximal occlusion than you would like. Um, gel foam, as we all know, it can be a little hard to deliver through a microcatheter, but even if it's not, uh, you know, we do get recanalization of those vessels sometimes, and we would prefer to have something more um, permanent, especially in these patients that are prone to rebleeding. Liquid is not generally recommended, um, but there are reports of people using glue, and if people are comfortable with glue and understand the time it takes for the you know, glue to solidify and mix their glue appropriately, I think it can be performed um, successfully. Coils we don't want to use, um, except in a few conditions. If we occlude the proximal bronchial artery and the patient bleeds the next day, you can't get back in. And that can be a problem you know, if repeat embolization is needed. Um, so usually, once again, you, you avoid coils. However, if you see an aneurysm, obviously we'll treat it like an aneurysm and we do want to coil that off. There are other times where people may coil off other arteries to block communication between the bronchial arteries and the systemic arteries. And this is to prevent non-target embolization. So complications, most common is chest pain. Um, and basically, rarely you can have um, 
you know, sequela of non-target embolization. Small particles go out really far. You get some ischemia of the esophagus or the bronchi or particle shunt, um, and you get systemic arterial embolization. I really don't, you know, hear about this happening often. And, you know, once again, the most severe complication that we worry about is spinal cord ischemia due to inadvertent occlusion of the spinal arteries. So some people um, recommend that if you even see the artery of the Damkowitz, the spinal artery, you should not embolize. Um, I guess it's based on operator preference and what um, you're comfortable with. As we saw in that 24-year-old female with cystic fibrosis, they went distal to the intercostal artery supplying the artery of the Damkowitz, and um, they were successful in embolizing, preventing bleeding, and um, not causing any complications. Recurrence. They used to think it was um, because of some technical difficulties, but um, a lot of the time, it's either because there was incomplete angiographic evaluation of all the arteries that could be involved, but even if you do visualize, you know, thoracic, abdominal aortic branches, and go through everything that you can, recurrence is just a problem because the patients have an underlying disease that bronchial artery embolization is not going to fix. So. In cases of infectious and neoplastic etiology, nearly all the patients re-hemorrhage. You can re-embolize, that's fine. But once again, we have to remember that this is not the definitive treatment. Surgery would be the definitive treatment. We can just be there to um, you know, help deal with the emergent uh, or urgent situation at the time. Just some images, because I keep mentioning there can be non-bronchial systemic arterial supply. Um, so here's the internal mammary. We did see one of these before. And um, the lung is being supplied. Bronchial arteries are actually coming off of this internal mammary. It's the left internal mammary artery with bronchial artery supply to the left lung, leading to hemoptysis. Here is a right intercostal. That, as you can see, has become completely hypertrophied and is you know, resulting in uh, hemoptysis. So in sum, we can use bronchial artery embolization, first line treatment for massive hemoptysis and a bridge to more definitive therapy. It is successful immediately and there are low complication rates except for the one uh, complication that we really do uh, you know, try to avoid. We can repeat this treatment um, at which time, if you've already, you know, previously seen the bronchial arteries and embolized them successfully, you can find a bunch of other sources sort of anywhere along the aorta and its branches that may have been recruited to supply blood to these inflammatory or oncologic processes, and um, which can therefore be contributing to the bleeding and hemoptysis. Uh -huh.